Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to the March PQA Quality Forum webinar. My name is Amanda Ryan, and I am PQA's Director of Education. Today's topic is the future of pharmacy, innovative practice, and evolving technology. Next slide, please. As usual, uh, before we get started here, I would like to call your attention to three housekeeping items. First is that attendees are encouraged to ask questions during the presentation using the questions panel that's on the right side of your screen. And then at the conclusion of the presentation, I will read the questions aloud for our speakers to answer. Second, the webinar recording and the slide deck will be available for PQA members within the week following the presentation, and you'll be able to find that on the member resources section of the PQA website. And then finally, I would like you to encourage all attendees to please complete the quick one minute survey that will appear at the conclusion of the webinar. We do always value your feedback. Next slide, please. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today. George Van Antwerp is a managing director with Deloitte Consulting that works with retailers, health plans, pharmacy benefit managers, integrated delivery networks, and specialty pharmacies on strategy and operations. He has worked in healthcare for over 20 years, including time spent at Express Scripts, Inventive Health, and multiple startups. George, thanks for being with us today. And with that, I will turn the floor over to you. All right, thank you, Amanda. And uh, thank you, PQA, for the opportunity. Appreciate all of you jumping on the call today. This is certainly one of my favorite topics uh, to talk about both the future of pharmacy and also the role of the pharmacist and how we see the evolution happening over the next you know, couple of years and then even a more longer term view. With that, if we jump to the next slide, I think there's really two things we're gonna spend some time talking about today. One, just the broader future trends that we see for the overall pharmacy industry and how we think some of the implications that will have upon how we educate pharmacists, how we think about the ecosystem and how work gets done. And then more tactically pulling forward from a long-term view to think about what the evolving role of the pharmacist could be and how we see some early actions happening today that are very positive signs for some of that evolution. Go to the next slide. I wanna to cut to the chase. I always like to kinda of, you know, give a little bit of the big picture and then we can kinda of go through how we got there. As we started talking about this a little bit before COVID, you know, we had looked at where we saw the future of health going and then evolved from future of health to really specifically look at some you know, subcategories, pharmacy being one of them. As we thought about the pharmacy space itself, we focused on three big areas. One was looking at the clinical uh, innovation that was happening, new treatments that were happening, you know, all the things that many of you are familiar with, the cell and gene therapies, digital therapeutics, and some really out there technology that was happening on the cutting edge. That showed us that the evolution from where we are today in kind of an oral solid and an infusion approach to pharmacy was going to change. Second, we began looking at the delivery of pharmacy. And certainly, we've had lots of discussion about the retailization of healthcare and what's happening in the retail pharmacy, much of what we see today with COVID with both testing and immunizations, but also what that really meant for where prescriptions would be filled in the future. And we'll click down on each of these as we go forward. Uh, and then finally, the third big thing we spent time you know, thinking about was the pharmacist role itself and what it would mean for them to be more of the provider or even eventually becoming the next generation PCP in the future. And all of that, if you think about it coming together, would put us at a point where we could really rethink how care was reimbursed and rethink how care was delivered at a very localized setting, given the presence of all the pharmacies we have in the US and the pharmacists as a embedded care force within the local communities. So if we go to the next slide, uh, I'll take you a little bit through the journey we went to get here. You know, first we started with, as I said, thinking about how we saw healthcare emerging. And we took a 20 year view, 21 year view, and we built that really on work we'd done with the X Prize, where we saw innovation happening in these seven year timeframes. And generally people were pretty good at understanding what would happen in the next seven years, where there was a couple of years of cutting edge and then a few years where things began to become the norm and then where you saw things become kind of institutionalized and a standard way of doing business. But as we got out into 14 years, 
plus, it was very difficult to forecast the future. And this is where the idea of exponential change versus linear change really plays out. And so we looked at you know, what was happening around quantum mechanics, what was happening around robotics, artificial intelligence, nanotech, and a lot of different things and said, you know, what would happen if all these future focused things played out and changed the ecosystem? And what did that mean for how we should be thinking about, you know, today's world? And so I set that really broad stage to then say, on the next slide, as we began to look at pharmacy itself, and as I said earlier, you know, some of the big things we looked at were, let's first start with the treatments themselves. And so did we see growth in digital therapeutics, which we certainly have seen a lot of buzz around and more and more digital therapeutics being talked about? You know, what was happening in the world of nutraceuticals? What was happening in implants? So implants, perhaps where a drug was part of the implant and could be released over time. We looked at what we saw around the CRISPR prime editing and how that could actually be modifying and address 80% of the typical chronic diseases that we saw. And even when I was doing some of the research for this, I met with a, a scientist that was working on programmable bacteria. And so he was able to program and control the bacteria from outside the body, inject them into the body, and then direct them at specific cancer cells. And now he was focusing on how to test that in humans and also how to 3D print those bacteria that could be then sent and made available at different places around the world. So as you saw some of that, it said, okay, well, we really need to be thinking differently on a long-term view here. You know, the second thing we began looking at was the actual distribution of drugs and saying, certainly we've seen what's happening in the retail store, but what does this mean? You know, where will kiosks play in the future? How do we think about telehealth? What about same-day delivery? And same-day delivery being, you know, the drones that people are talking about and piloting, robots or bots, the self-driving vehicles, and even 3D printing, which we thought, you know, was an interesting area to really explore. And I'll go a little bit more into that here as we go through this. You know, the third thing we focused on was the use of data and automation and really thinking about the power of AI. And so how would that empower the pharmacist and even the tech to operate at the top of their license and to be able to do very different tasks that would allow them to play much more a broader part of the care team and alleviate some of the things that we know they spend a lot of time on today in terms of you know, counting pills, dealing with prior auth and all these other things. What did data and technology and AI mean for the future of the profession? Uh, the fourth thing we looked at was really the shift to precision medicine. And even I would argue the shift toward precision benefits in the future, but how did genomic data and some of the things that are happening around the biome changed the way that treatment protocols looked and the way that we were able to make sure that the drugs that were prescribed were appropriate for that person. And that began to be really interesting as we went back to what I was talking about, about 3D printing and saying, all right, as we think about 3D printing, would we be able to 3D print specific dosing? And what would that mean for a patient? Because today, if we have a 20 and a 40 milligram approved, well, what if based on weight and genetics and everything else, I need you know, 32 milligrams? How could we do that? And, and the challenge then being, how would I do that cost effectively and be able to compete and create these 3D printed drugs at scale? And perhaps, you know, eventually they're moved to the home, but in the short term, maybe there are certain centers of excellence that are doing that. And then the final thing was really getting into what was the ability, again, back at the data level to use this quantum computing that was coming out to think about enabling real-time diagnoses happening at the point of care and being able to change the treatment protocols that were used for patients. Um, and I think the final thing, which obviously can't be ignored, is the payment paradigm here. And so, you know, there's lots of things without getting into, you know, different political perspectives. But, you know, at the end of the day, what we spent time thinking about is if 80% of cost is driven by decisions that people make and situations that they're in, you know, so you have to address both the health equity and the drivers of health, along with helping people make healthier decisions. You know, those are things that insurance and other coverage and incentives can be focused on. But if there's 20% of costs that are 100% tied to your genetic makeup, you know, how would we think differently about the reimbursement structure for those that might have to be something that were covered even in the U.S. at some type of, you know, global capitation or some type of, you know, universal coverage? 
So that was the big kind of future of pharmacy perspective we started working from. And if we click into the next page, certainly as we looked into that, we saw that in many cases, the future was already happening. We saw bots that were already operating in homes at scale. We saw drone deliveries being it, being started to be piloted, you know, which is funny. I always think about this as a perfect example of how fast change happens. Two or three years ago, I gave a couple of presentations about the possibility of drone deliveries in pharmacy and basically got laughed out of the room by people that, you know, uh, 18 months later were working on pilots. So, you know, the reality is some of this stuff that we think about, the change can happen really quickly. And certainly we've seen how COVID has advanced some of the changes around telehealth and other ways that we think about delivery. Certainly we'll talk a little bit about that with home delivery uh, in the future here. The other ones on the right here, you know, we looked at a bunch of different lab uh, experiments that were happening with these digestible robots that could then be controlled from outside the body, some of the nanotech that was being tried. And all these things, again, said, wow, some of the things that seem cutting edge, bleeding edge are actually being tried in a lab setting today. We go to the next page. You know, what we could see after that was, you know, beginning to really think about what the channel was doing. And I'll start on the right, because I think we're seeing a ton of this today because of COVID. So while we've often talked about mail or home delivery, you know, I think they were somewhat used in the same way. I think right now we're beginning to see a difference of, you know, the traditional mail approach versus a lot of the digital pharmacies that are very focused on getting the prescription into the home or even the courier service or, you know, Uber type of approach that's happening by the retail pharmacies. But the idea is that patients and consumers are much more comfortable and have been very comfortable during COVID with getting things delivered to their home. And so really understanding how that can happen and what their expectations are and how to change that experience has been, and we ex anticipated it to be, you know, uh, much more a bigger trend going forward, even though traditional mail we've seen, you know, on a downward uh, spiral for about 10 years, the idea of actually getting the script to the home was going to change. In the middle, specialty is certainly where we see you know, about 50% of the spend today, lots of investments if you look at the drug pipeline. The question is, will this traditional specialty delivery by mail, which has become you know, the dominant channel today, really be the long-term channel? As we drilled into it, and I was just texting yesterday with one of the CMOs about this, and yeah, I think what we see is two things. So one, the traditional specialty space that's happening today increasingly being able to be delivered at a retail setting, whether that's a chain or an independent, but that there's much more happening at the hospital setting. So we certainly have seen hospital specialty pharmacies grow significantly with 340B pricing and others, but the idea of the complex patient being treated from a drug perspective and managed from a drug perspective within the hospital, especially on rare orphan cell and gene therapy type of drugs, is increasingly becoming common. Now, we could have the site of care discussion around whether that's physically in the hospital setting or in an outpatient setting, but increasingly less and less happening through the male specialty pharmacy with some of these more complex drugs, and even you know, jumping beyond the white bagging and brown bagging that some people talk about today. I'm not gonna spend a bunch of time on retail. I think everybody knows and has seen what's happening from a retail perspective around you know, health destinations, specialty centers of excellence, the idea of you know, what uh, can happen in those physical settings as consumers come there for overall health and building on both the local access that the pharmacy has, but also the hours and convenience that people are looking at and able to talk to a clinician and talk to a pharmacist. I think there was just an article yesterday talking about how many patients are going to the local pharmacist to talk to them about you know, how to save money on prescriptions, which is something many of you are probably very familiar with. Let's get, click to the next slide. So I think as we go forward, you know, and drilling into the second half of the presentation here for me, you know, was really talking about the role of the pharmacist. So initially, you know, a year, year and a half ago, we really split it into three paths as we thought about pharmacists. One was there was an opportunity for them to be more and more engaged from a digital perspective. So if we think about telepharmacy, if we think about digital therapeutics, if we think about, you know, addressing food and other needs, there was much more that was going to be done virtually in the future. And what was the 
role and training necessary for pharmacists to succeed there. The second was in this medical complex patient perspective and how pharmacists should be embedded within the care team, within the provider site. Certainly we're seeing some people experiment with that now and has had very good outcomes by putting the pharmacists in an oncology clinic, for example, and helping the providers make decisions about the right medication and treat the patients. And then finally, on the far right, again, something that's been a huge you know, spike during COVID has been an increased focus on behavioral health and pharmacists that were really cross-trained to be able to address you know, the social determinants of health or drivers of health, to be able to talk to patients. And in many cases, not only do that perhaps at the counter, but also getting into the home as we see hospital at home and other shifts toward home-based care. What would that mean? And how would that pharmacist be someone that was able to observe the complexities of care and complexities of somebody's daily life and reflect on what that might mean for treatment protocols and the way to engage that patient? So as we go forward here, if we go to the next slide, I think you know we then really ended up spending a lot of time on this role of the pharmacist. And I think you know as we took the long-term view, a lot of clients wanted to you know, talk about what this meant for the short term. And this was one of the big areas beyond kind of thinking about how drugs were dispensed and the consumer digital experience. You know, but what would this really mean for their pharmacist? And so if we go to the next page, you know, we certainly began to drill in and look at you know, how the pharmacist responsibilities were shifting. And so you know, I think most people are in level one and level two today. You know, we certainly, there's all the work being done to fill prescriptions and do the core clinical edits, address prior auth and other UM edits to talk to patients about how to save money. You know, and this is where there was a report that came out last year that said, you know, only 10% of pharmacist time is actually, you know, interacting directly with the, the end consumer or the patient. You know, they're spending all this time counting pills, dealing with PA, sitting on the phone, all these things. So how do we take this highly skilled resource and begin to leverage them to operate on the right-hand side of the slide so that they're getting more into you know, medication optimization, closing gaps in care, you know, collecting vital signs, being involved in figuring out the right testing, perhaps getting testing results back, helping the patient to understand the test results. You know, ultimately, even in you know, some cases, they can prescribe a handful of drugs today, but perhaps be able to prescribe a much broader panel, be involved in diagnosis, get involved in more and more of the pharmacogenomics as we see all of that happening. So this is where you, know, you really get to operate at the top of the license. Now, obviously, this has a few constraints. And so if we jump to the next slide, you know, as we did this, we were looking at what were those typical constraints. Certainly, there's all the regulatory federal state guidelines that exist. And I think we're seeing some of those be addressed. And you can see even in Ohio, the first state where a pharmacist can get an NPI. But some of the other chances we're seeing is how payers can address this and begin to recognize the pharmacist and reimburse them for certain services. Now, at the retail site, a lot of this then came down to an operational question of, well, you know, right now, especially at a larger chain, you know, very volume focused, how do I address workload so that we're not putting an increased burden on the pharmacist and leading to issues? We've seen, you know, Central Phil has been tried a few times with some limited success historically. I think with the new technology and other predictive models, there's a better chance, and you're seeing a few people do this today, with increased central fill models and applying some algorithms to be more predictive about you know, how they can predict refills, fill them ahead of time, how they can do workload balancing, getting into the technology side of it. In a presentation you know, I gave recently at uh, AMCP, we looked specifically at interviewing some of the software companies and startups and companies like Thrifty White and some of the innovation that was out there to look at how they were able to take pharmacy data, medical data, lab data, social determinants of health data, integrate that, you know, create AI algorithms that allowed them to target and segment, you know, different patients and then drive the intervention. And ultimately this obviously then needing to get into, you know, an economic model to say, you know, if we look at the retail pharmacy space, it's been a question of, you know, compressing margin year after year after year. So if you can't just ask them to do more without changing the reimbursement structure. And if we go to the next page, I think initially as we began to go into this, you know, there was some skepticism about how much was happening. I think we were excited to find out that, 
Well, you have the opportunities on the left, which is the traditional dispensing fee, the DIR networks that people can talk about as you know punitive or trying to tie to quality. But until you started to get for get into the fee for service, paying for specific tasks, the ability for pharmacists to do medical billing, and really shifting to the far right around PMPM value-based, even risk-based arrangements, you know, you weren't fully recognizing the power of the pharmacist and asking them to be you know, a broader piece of the care team. But we found people doing every doing things all across this entire spectrum. Now, most of the times this was a payer dealing directly with, you know, the retail pharmacies or dealing with somebody like CPESN who was putting together a network of pharmacies and contracting with them. They were not going through the PBM for a lot of these types of engagements in this new model. So I think as I wrap up here, you know, going to the next slide, you know, really this begged a lot of questions that we were sitting down with companies and talking about is, as you see this broader long-term view, as you see the opportunity to push pharmacists to operate at the top of their license, you know, where is it that you want to play? How are you enabling this? How are you taking advantage of those pharmacists, you know, as part of your care team? How are you envisioning what they can do? And then you have to make a series of key decisions around, you know, especially where you want to play and how you want to win you know, is this a Medicare play, a Medicaid play, is you're focused on specific conditions or on a broader, you know, challenge that you're trying to address. And so, you know, I'll leave you with on the next slide here, you know, really the vision, you know, that we have, and I know many of you that are pharmacists have, which is, you know, what is the way and the path to make pharmacists be this next generation of provider or prescriber, and really thinking about what does this mean relative to you know, nurse practitioners, uh, physician assistants, the current PCPs. And I think that's where there's some really exciting opportunities for us all to collaborate. Thanks. All right, George, thanks so much. Um, we appreciate you sharing your insights into the future of pharmacy practice today. I did want to remind attendees, we do have some questions coming in, but if you do have a question, uh, please enter it for George using the panel on the right side of your screen. And then when we get to the end of the session today, we will address all questions together. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit and hear about work that has been happening at Kaiser Permanente. And that's being done to develop centralized services, technology and digital services. And that really enables Kaiser's progressive approach to integrating clinical pharmacists into overall care management. I've got three speakers to introduce to you. So joining us today is Sarun Arunke. He is the Vice President and Information Officer of Pharmacy and Laboratory Technology within Care Delivery Technology Services at Kaiser Permanente. He and his team are responsible for providing strategy and technology expertise while delivering solutions that enable Kaiser Permanente business strategies for the national pharmacy and laboratory groups. And then also joining us is Manesh Batka. He is the National Senior Director of Outpatient Services at Kaiser Permanente. He is involved in managing people, designing pharmacies, creating business processes, and implementing technology across outpatient pharmacies to provide Kaiser, Kaiser Permanente with high quality outpatient services. Manesh is also responsible for developing and implementing strategic business plans, measurement tools, and operational best practices to ensure performance and organizational standards are exceeded. And then finally, we will hear from Lynn de Guzman, who is the Regional Clinical Operations Manager for Kaiser Northern California and the National Pharmacy C Medicare STARS lead. Lynn and her team establish objectives, devise strategies, and direct all aspects of operations for the Medicare Part D medication therapy management, medication adherence, deprescribing, and psychiatry pharmacist program, as well as national products, projects, and regional projects across the Northern California region. Thanks to all of you for joining us today, and Saran, I will turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you, and PQA, thank you for having us today. Um, so uh, our team here wanted to, uh, number one, like I said, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to share what we do. Uh, and George, thank you for sharing kind of the vision of tomorrow of where we think we're going. And Kaiser Permanente is at the cutting edge um, in, in many of those areas. And we wanted to talk about a few things. So Manny and I will be talking a little bit about the scope and size of Kaiser, how we're set up, and a little bit about the history. And then Len is going to go into an example of the clinical services that we offer and how we leverage our technology to do that. And then I'll come back and talk a little bit about the leap forward or the cutting edge components that we're doing 
around AI and ML to do some of the things that George talked about in terms of reducing the workload for pharmacists and providers and actually leveraging our technology to do better interventions and outcomes for our members. Um, next slide, please. So Kaiser Permanente, for um, those that aren't familiar with it, is a history, a company with a history of over 75 years. And the idea started from industrialist Henry Kaiser and Dr. Sidney Garfield in how do we provide care for workers that were shifting from across America to work in areas of opportunity. And the idea had its genesis at the, the Grand Coulee Dam project during the Great Depression, where thousands of workers were coming there from around the country. And the big challenge at the time was how do we provide care for not only that worker, but their families as well. Uh, that idea really took off during World War II when even more workers were coming from around the country to the shipyards in the Oakland, Northern California area, the Washington, Seattle area, and then the steel factories down in the Southern California area. So they had to provide um, care for hundreds of thousands of members. And at the time, they came up with what was a revolutionary idea. We are going to build care facilities, hospitals, medical clinics, and we're going to charge the members a small fee, but we're going to take care of their complete health. So we're not going to charge them for service. We're going to say whatever you need is going to be provided to you in that fee that you pay. And I think at the time it was a dollar a week, which you know it's, it's, it was a very reasonable rate at the time. Um, so that idea continued to grow. And over um, 75 years later, we now serve 12.2 million members. We are in Hawaii. We're on the West Coast. We're in Colorado, Georgia, and then the East Coast. We're not in every state, but we're in states that we had Genesis in, and now we're expanding to different markets. So as you can see, we have over 23,000 physicians, over 15,000 pharmacy employees. Um, you know, we have 39 hospitals, uh, close to 700 medical office buildings, and over 400 pharmacies. And those pharmacies encompass anything from outpatient, inpatient, infusion. Um, so there's a lot of work going on in the pharmacy world. And the pharmacy world is heavily integrated with Kaiser Permanente's provider groups. We round with them, we do other components with them, and, we'll, and Lynn will talk a little bit more about that. Currently, Kaiser's foundation um, is built around three separate entities. So there's the Kaiser Foundation Hospitals, there's the Kaiser Foundation Health Plan. So we're our own health plan as well. So we sell insurance and we provide care. And then we have what are uh, eight, called eight permanent medical, group, medical groups. And those are in each region across um, the country. And those medical groups are really closely integrated with our hospitals and health plan to provide care. Um, so we know that the healthcare environment is rapidly evolving. Um, even though we were cutting edge a while ago, a lot of folks are catching up to us in terms of the model. So we're really starting to think, how do we differentiate ourselves in terms of member care, member outcomes? And a big component of that is the way that we work together from our clinical and pharmacy perspectives with our providers, our nurses and our administrators. And really, how do we leverage IT and technology to do some things that we have an inherent advantage of? So we sit on um, data from birth to life for millions and millions of members. But how do we take that data and leverage it for outcomes rather than just keeping it as a record? So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lynn to talk a little bit about the diabetes examples that show. Oh, I'm sorry, to Manny to talk about the rest of the scope of Kaiser. Not a problem. Thank you, Siren, and thank you, uh, PQA, for having us. And what I'm going to do before we go uh, dive into uh, a little bit more details from from Lynn regarding some of our clinical services that we provide and programs, I wanted to just take a moment to kind of go through Kaiser's footprint. And Saren did a, a great job kind of setting that up and giving us the history. But really, what I'd like to talk about is our opportunity. And with those 400 uh, plus outpatient pharmacies, we fill about 100 million prescriptions a year. And as we started to see a shift, and I know George mentioned this, the impact of COVID, moving from local fills to more mail order, keeping our patients out of our outpatient pharmacies, really delivering um, the care to their homes, as opposed to having the patient come into our local pharmacies, really that shift and how we are integrated and in providing care to these members has also changed. And on my role here at Kaiser Permanente is is to really take a look at those processes and the technologies to free up the time of our outpatient pharmacists. Because as you guys all probably are aware, I'm, traditionally it's been about getting the pres prescription out as fast as possible. Well, obviously that may have been 
the mentality 20 years ago, but obviously we know there's a great amount of opportunity here for us to be involved in the patient's care and freeing up the outpatient staff in order to be an active participant in achieving high quality outcomes is what we want to do here at um, in our outpatient pharmacies. And obviously you can see from here, our drug spend is is over $10 billion. This slide probably needs to be updated, to be honest with you. But um, there is a huge breadth of opportunity here. And I'm going to turn it over to Lynn to kind of go through the details of one of our clinical programs that she's had a lot to do with. And we'll go from there. Lynn, take it Great. away. All right. Thanks, Manny. Um, so yes, I wanted to talk about and highlight one of the many transformational and innovative programs that we here do at Kaiser, and it's to address polypharmacy. So as a lot of you know that patients who are taking five or more medications have a risk of going into the hospital and experiencing side effects. So we launched a program for diabetes deprescribing. And just to kind of also define deprescribing, it's actually the systematic process to reduce the dose or stop medications. Um, next slide. So this is just a high overview process of this program. And I really want to emphasize that this was such a collaborative effort with our physicians. So it's not just a pharmacy program. I really want to, you know, tout that this is an integrated healthcare um, model of a program on helping our patients with their medications. We've utilized technology to identify patients who are eligible, uh, work with our physicians, and also maximize technology to get authorizations, and had our pharmacists outreach to patients and also provide follow-up uh, within our processes. Next slide. This is also who we actually targeted um, in uh, finding opportunities to deprescribe diabetes medications. We used our massive data sets within our integrated healthcare system and our electronic medical record to really pinpoint which members would benefit from deprescribing. And as you can see, we looked at lab values, age, chronic conditions, hospitalizations, and filling their medications, so claims. Um, and also look at favor, factors that favor deprescribing. So as we look more into the chart, uh, looking at complex medication regimen, identify if these patients had a high fall risk, how long were they on treatments, and you know their history of the severe or recurrent hypoglycemia. So with all of these technical details involved, uh, with the data that we have at Kaiser, we were able to really target these members to find opportunities to stop their medications or reduce their dose. Next slide. In partnership with our physicians and clinical champions and quality leaders, we uh, kind of grouped together to figure out how we should deprescribe medication. Not a lot of literature is out there, but we did did small tests of change to just define general guidelines on how much to deprescribe, how often, and when to follow up. Again, I was under the clinical judgment of the pharmacist and in close uh, partnership with our physicians, we did meet with them and did case conferences to really kind of scope out what you see here. So again, it's, um, it's not well-defined and you could see there's not a lot of literature, but we're really excited that we were able to build these guidelines for our pharmacists um, to have them practice at the top of their license. Next slide. So these are just parts of the program that we felt were foundational items in order to build the program. We developed playbooks, which incorporated some guidelines, as I just uh, demonstrated at the last slide. We looked at literature. Uh, we also even partnered with some external partners, such as IHI, the Lawn Institute, and even uh, the Canada Deprescribing Network. We actually maximize our documentation and our medical record, electronic medical record, uh, data tracking as well to kind of ensure the workflow was efficient so we can reach out to more members. As we develop SQL codes for our patient list and dashboards that really help maximize our pharmacist time so they're not spending too much time in the medical record. And then we developed scripting. Uh, we found opportunities to partner with our health education uh, teams who actually uh, 
uh, trained our pharmacists not only in motivational interviewing, but we also learned behavioral science techniques, uh, how to have conversations with our members and our providers on stopping medications or reducing the dose. We use reporting dashboards, you know, develop champion and stakeholder lists. And again, um, our clinical providers, we used our um, MTM pharmacists who've already been experienced with comprehensive medication review and targeted medication review. They utilize that foundational experience to help them having these conversations with our members of stopping their medications or reducing uh, the dose. Next slide. So these are some of the technology tools that we developed in the program uh, to really help our pharmacists and our members and our physician partners. Uh, we use SharePoint sites to kind of have collated information. We use the electronic medical record, as you see, to collate our data, to build uh, smart phrases is what we call them in Kaiser, so that it was easier for our pharmacists to document their interaction and so that our physicians would understand you know, what was happening as we were talking with our members. As we were applying small tests of change with our dashboards, we were able to pivot quickly to make changes as needed to our inclusion criteria. So I know I shared the inclusion criteria in a couple slides before, but it did go through several iterations as we try to develop what is the best approach which members would value from our pharmacist intervention. Next slide. So I know this is a very busy slide, but this is just to demonstrate all the multiple factors it took for us to really drive this effort, you know, as a within our healthcare system. And it took culture and content and technology, uh, developed a lot of partnerships with our division of research folks, physician education, health education, um, other physician leaders, our quality leaders, pharmacy and nursing. Um, so as we started to get into the work, we really started to understand that we needed to build these relationships, build the technology and the content to ensure that we were successful in our work for our members. Next slide. Some of the challenges that we had, or I like to call it opportunities, was a culture change. We had to train our clinicians um, to really think differently. You know, when you go into the physician office and you're sick, or if your lab value is not at goal, what is our knee-jerk reaction is to add a medication. Um, and so this is kind of the culture that we had kind of going into this work. So as we were asking our members or even our physicians, uh, can we actually stop a medication to this patient who was at goal for their blood sugars? And so again, we really use behavioral science techniques, really explaining to everyone that your body changes over time. You may not be metabolizing the drug as fast. So let's go and let's revisit your medication and see if it's something that you need. And, uh, you know, our physicians also kind of push back a little bit, you know, really trying to say that, well, I've worked really hard with this patient to get them to their A1C level. Why are we rocking the boat? And again, it, it made a lot of sense that they put in a lot of effort into this. So we work closely with our physician partners to really how do we share this message? Um, so we did host a video conference uh, CME. Um, that targeted our physician group to really just let them be know, let them uh, understand the awareness of polypharmacy, um, what is the side effects of polypharmacy that the, is an issue, and also what's the solution. And the solution was deprescribing. Um, again, we did have 50 to 60 percent rate of accepted deprescribing, and again, we just went through small tests of change. We're trying to maximize our inclusion criteria by using the technology. Um, further collaboration with our physicians, and then also just trying to incorporate additional training with our pharmacy staff. And um, we've learned, um, working with the Division of Research, what a lengthy research process entails. So I will share some of the results that we found after one year. Um, you know, we didn't realize how, you know, lengthy that process was, but we really wanted to get those outcomes to make sure to, that we were doing the right thing for our members. Next slide. 
Um, and again, some takeaways for you as you start to build clinical programs within your setting. You know, we uh, really want to uh, highlight that finding your clinical champion um, is a definitely a huge win. You know, as I uh, work with this, you know, Dr. Maisha Draves is my physician partner with this work. Um, as we work together, we found clinical physician champions, nursing leaders, physician education, and health education leaders to really help tell our story. We started these active collaborations early. Uh, we did partner with um, our high-risk medication physician champion, Dr. Carter Chang, our geriatrician uh, physician champion, Dr. Michael Mason. Um, and we maintained strong communication. We had, we had regular meetings as we started this work in developing the criteria, developing workflows uh, with our pharmacy staff. Next slide. Some of the learnings is, you know, how do we um, create, what should we do first? And we were really fortunate that we started early with standardized documentation and also developing workflows early. Uh, this helped provide consistency as we had different pharmacists doing the work and also really made a standardized way of telling our story as in our electronic medical record is an opportunity for all our providers, uh, uh, you know, nurses, other, you know, um, nutritionists who look at the medical record, how are they able to see what we are working with? Um, as we use and maximize our data, we are able to set up a performance improvement foundation. As we used our, our dashboards with our data, we were able to implement small tests of change and make those changes quickly um, in our workflow. We used a centralized repository site, our SharePoint site, where we had all our resources, literature, data, and guidelines in one place so that everybody was able to see what we were doing in real time. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we did have key meetings in the beginning as we refined this workflow with all stakeholders involved. And of course, you know, I do have a Medicare STARS hat, so we wanted to consider our quality metrics. We did have, you know, other leaders asking us about our adherence. You know, as you know, the denominator for medication adherence is two fills or more. So if I stop a medication, am I messing up with the adherence scores? Um, we did do a small test of change and did notice that we were actually improving adherence in um, the drug classes. We saw an improvement in statin medication, which we thought was interesting since we weren't even touching the statins. We were touching the diabetes medication. So with that small test of change, we knew that we were doing the right thing, so we kept moving forward. Other system learnings as we're starting to incorporate this work, you know, partnering with Sarong is how we can integrate AI and ML into this work. So really excited um, how we got to this point. Okay. Next slide. So just wanted to share some of the outcomes that we did. We, uh, we did publish this work at AMCP um, and looking at the one year uh, look back. So as you can see, we did see a low, um, with patients that we deprescribe medication, they experience a significantly lower um, experience, uh, hypoglycemia was lower. So very exciting to see that we did have some change um, with the patients that we deprescribe uh, the medication. And also, as you also see, an absor observed mortality rate was significantly lower in that deprescribing group versus the usual care group. Next slide. Again, more data just to kind of reinforce that the work that we're doing is the right thing for our members. So the adjusted odds ratio for mortality for the deprescribing group was 0.41. So it did, this shows that patients were about 60% less likely to have hypoglycemia. Sorry, next slide, thank you. And again, we wanted to ensure safety. You know, are we going to have an increase of high blood sugars as we're starting to take off medications? And we didn't see any difference in the hyperglycemia visits or any difference of proportion of A1C goal of less than seven. So again, just to reinforce that what we were doing is the right thing uh, for our members. Next slide. 
So some of the strengths, again, is the integrated healthcare system, which provided us access uh, to all our data that we had uh, with patient encounters, labs, prescription data, looking at hospitalizations, um, also even uh, physician visits, and especially our strengths is our partnership with our physicians, um, really working that with them closely side by side in building this program. Um, some of our limitations was as a retrospective analysis selection bias, uh, but, you know, really, you know, really excited with this program. How, what's the next step? You know, can we look at an economic model? Can we discuss kind of how can this become a reimbursement structure, utilizing and maximizing this program? So some things that we're looking to in the future as we kind of expand this work uh, to other Kaiser programs, other regions. Next slide. So what are the next steps? So, you know, we are looking at looking at how do we make our have our pharmacist practice at the top of their license. And George did mention this, um, you know, looking at how we can use digital, medical, and behavioral. And so those are kind of the next things that we're doing. Uh, we are exploring how we are working with therapists in medication management services to support our members in the mental health arena. So we do have a program here uh, looking at patients with mild to moderate depression and generalized anxiety, also managing patients with bipolar disorder. We're also trying to explore and utilizing technology and data is how do we address social determinants of health in medication adherence, but also in other programs. And this can help with our pharmacists as our pharmacists are being trained in motivational interviewing and behavioral science to really help them address these issues. But we need technology to kind of help target, like who can we target for that? What type of social determinants should we target? And of course, as I mentioned, as we just brought up the program earlier, we do have opportunities to expand this program to other uh, drug classes, other disease states. Uh, we currently do have a project looking at patients who have who are 75 years and older taking 10 or more medications. So we are kind of even using more broader strokes of trying to uh, incorporate uh, deprescribing. So next, I'm going to pass it back to Sarong, who will talk about some technology enablers um, for Kaiser. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you. Um, so one of my roles here at Kaiser Permanente is to um, do a leap forward strategy and planning and implementation. And we're working heavily around AI and ML, um, specifically around how to enable the data that we sit on and make those outcomes better, but also make the providers and pharmacists' lives better. And one of the things that we're um, blessed with at Kaiser Permanente is that our systems are all integrated. So anything from our Epic EMR to our pharmacy system, to our lab system, to our appointment system, to our social determinants that we're um, ingesting from other um, folks around the country, we actually can churn all of that data into an outcome engine and a learning algorithm. Next slide, please. So I'll cover two of the components and, and POCs and projects that we're doing here. We have multiple, multiple in the, in the um, pipeline here. But one of the things that we're doing is looking at AI and ML for predictive models rather than retrospective models to look at med adherence. We're also integrating social determinants of health. We're integrating the lab components, obviously the Epic EMR. We're looking at things like appointment misses, um, anything that can give us a lead to create a risk score for a patient to say, I need a pharmacist, nurse, physician, whomever, um, to interact with that patient and intervene prior to them missing a medication. So we have um, multiple achievements that we have. We have a POC that's going um, on right now. We've targeted the Spanish speaking population in our Southern California Downey patient area. And we're looking at how do we uh, leverage the risk scores that we've done in our data environments and how do they translate to the live environment with actual patients. And we're doing that modeling and tracking right now so we're leveraging multiple different initiatives that we've had within Kaiser Permanente, our pharmacy digital transformation work, which is our front door to our members, our two-way texting, our uh, web mobile applications. We also have things like videos and things of that nature that we're able to interact with or send to patients to interact with us in a different way. We have telehealth where we can actually call up the patient. They can talk to us on video or the phone. Um, and this AI ML algorithm is extremely effective in our um, pilot model, not in our pilot models, but in our um, sample models on data that we uh, ran it against. And AI and ML continues to learn is the you know, way I like to think about it, but it's um, getting better every day. 
And we have about three months left in this POC and study. We'll get to our quality and research folks and show that that works. Hopefully, <laughs> I'm confident it will. Um, and then we'll expand this to other areas of Kaiser Permanente and other patient populations. Um, next, please. Um, another pilot that we're doing right now is um, also leveraging the data that we sit on in a different way. So one of the things that we know um, from a pharmacist perspective is that sometimes we're either too data rich, too um, alert rich, but how do we leverage AI and ML to put the information at the pharmacist's fingertip at the right point in the workflow without having to do manual work, going into our pharmacy system, going into our Epic EMR system? Uh, how do we put that information where the pharmacist can make a clinical, a clinical decision for a potential intervention um, at the right, at the patient level. So not at the population health level, but at the patient level. So one of the things that we're doing right now is looking at our lab system. And the, the simple use case is that we have a patient who had a lab test two weeks ago, has been on a liver metabolized medication for years, but that uh, lab test from two weeks ago shows abnormalities, right? High liver enzymes, whatever it is. Um, our AI and ML algorithms churn through that and they actually flash a um, intervention suggestion to the pharmacist at the workflow when they're filling that prescription. And that will show things that the two week lab test, it'll show the medication, it'll show the history in a graph to say, hey, their liver enzymes were fine and all of a sudden we had a spike. And that should trigger the pharmacist to do some more homework, talk to the provider, talk to the patient, see what that um, intervention should be. But what we're trying to do here is leverage the um, technology that we have, the data that we have, while making the pharmacist's life easier, while while well, improving outcomes without having to do manual work. So we're reducing um, the, the quote unquote potential of a mistake as much as possible at the individual personal level. So, you know, we're, I'm super excited about what we're doing um, from an AI and ML perspective. Um, there's dozens of these things in the pipeline right now, um, both in pharmacy, both on the provider side, so radiology and things of that nature. And we're investing very heavily in this because we know that from a pharmacist outcome perspective, we need to make their lives easier, practice at the top of their ladder, but we need to provide them the tools to do so. And we, you know, again, we have 15,000 pharmacy um, employees and team members, and we need to free their time up to do these type of interventions. And our IT strategy is really truly built around this. And how do we then leverage our digital channels and our interaction with the patient to improve those outcomes? Um, so with that, you know, I do want to thank Kiki Wei for having us here. I know we're at time, so thank you all and looking forward to any questions. Okay, thank you to all of you for presenting today and sharing all of your insights and the great things that are going on at Kaiser that gives us a really good vision of what pharmacy could be like and continuing to think into the future. And um, we have received several questions um, over the course of the presentations. And so I'm gonna try my best to get to most of these and maybe take some of the themes from several of the questions and put them together. So hopefully we can get people the answers they're looking for. So the first one, George, I'll start with you on this one is related to licensing and scope of practice. So when we think about the future of pharmacy, um, it seems that supporting the technician in their role as well, things like uh, immunizations and then other services that the technician may be able to take responsibility for that they don't now um, will be helpful as we move into the future, as well as thinking policy-wise for the pharmacist scope of practice. So some organizations are very much invested in expanding the pharmacist scope of practice where, where some may not be, and some state laws may be um, hindrance as well as far as that is concerned. So do you have any comments on that? Any thoughts related to pharmacist and technician scope of practice that we can do to help move some of these future initiatives forward? Sure, we probably could talk for a while since there's so much uh, variation state by state. But I mean, I, at the high level, I agree. I mean, certainly there's you know both the pharmacist and the tech, and I think thinking at the state level, both you know how do you promote and support the lobbying and legislation that's going on today to encourage the role of the pharmacist to be expanded, and I think we also have to leverage the lessons learned that have come out of COVID you know, testing and vaccination where there were some freedoms that were given to the pharmacists in different states to, you know, do testing, to, you know, interpret the test results in some cases, even then to, you know, prescribe a drug in some states. So I think taking that and capitalizing on those experiences is gonna, is gonna be important. And I would encourage as I'm the non-pharmacist here, if anybody from the Kaiser team may have a, 
uh, a broader, different perspective. No, absolutely. Um, George, completely agree with you, I think. With the variations from state to state, it's challenging to implement some of those things that a technician can do versus what a pharmacist can do. I think there's opportunity there and definitely us working towards that is um, where we want to go. All right. Thank you for um, those thoughts. I appreciate that. Uh, next question is related to um, some of the Kaiser services. So for the Kaiser team, are you currently incorporating pharmacogenomics or any sort of pharmacogenetic testing um, into your MTM services or other services for patients? So maybe I can start with that, Lynn, and then I'll turn it over to you for the clinical MTM components. So yes, we're investing heavily in pharm pharmacogenomics, personalized medicine, in fact, my team, um, along with our providers, are working on a brand new genetics lab in Berkeley, California, that's, that's scheduled to open in the next six months. Um, we're really looking at that personalized medicine component. Um, we're also looking at how do we take that genomics information, tie it to all of the other data that we sit on to do an intervention um, at the personal level. Um, so the answer is yes, and we have a lot of work going on, um, in fact, heavy investment around that today. Um, we'll be looking at different genetics labs around the country. Um, we're actually going to be doing some um, AI and ML work around that as well, and we're working with external strategic partners that are leaders in the industry. So the answer is yes. Um, we're doing some of that intervention today, and it's only going to expand over the next 12 to 18 months. And Lynn, I don't know if you have some more on that. Yes, so we're, you know, we're heavily waiting on Sarong's team to build the technology so that our pharmacists will be enabled to do those tools. And we actually have already collaborated with our physician partners and our lead geneticists um, in, our, in our area to kind of start that work. So the discussion has been started already. Okay, perfect. Lots of exciting changes coming there. I'm looking forward to seeing how you all progress with that. Um, looks like we've got time for one more question. Um, George, I'm going to uh, put this one to you, and then if the Kaiser team would like to add as well, please feel free to do that. So when we are um, talking about a time frame for getting everybody in alignment, so value-based care from all participants, so we're talking about pharmacies, we're talking about providers, payers, manufacturers, um, there always seems to be a rate limiting step in getting from fee for from fee for service to value based care, and everybody may be on different time frames. Do you have a prediction that you might like to offer for when we might see that happen, and any other thoughts around that? Wow. Um, so I'll uh, pull out my crystal ball. I mean, I, I think we're still, you know, unfortunately, probably a decade away. Um, and I think especially, you know, there's two things that have to happen. One. You know the shared risk between you know right now you have value-based care which is often provider plan and you have value-based contracting which is pharma you know payer or pbm but the three-way relationship generally doesn't exist and some of that's because at a therapeutic area sharing risk you know across drugs is not something you know the average manufacturer wants to take on you know and i think to get there it's going to take two things one some regulatory change that addresses the rebate construct that exists versus you know risk-based care because why would I take on a you know risk-based arrangement when I can get a better uh, or more effective and simpler deal with rebates and two you know how do I actually create a three-way you know capitated or shared risk environment so my guess is a decade yeah, right. and I would add one thing um, you know we're, we're fortunate again at Kaiser to um, have that advantage today and that's that's the genesis of how we started so um, our, our pharmacy teams actually do anything from strategic buys right from manufacturers direct we warehouse certain meds we um, use ABC and direct shipments in some cases but we contract directly with medication or med medication manufacturers and then we do all the things that Lean's team does to make sure that we reduce the risk use the right medications through qualitative studies um, and we don't charge per fee for our members. So we have a membership fee on a monthly basis, annual basis, and then all of that medical care is taken into consideration, the pharmaceutical care is taken into consideration around that fee. So our interest is quality and outcomes first, affordability second, and then really how do we make that model continue to work with all of the changing environmental changes. 
All right, thanks to both of you for your insights on that question. We are out of time. So I just wanted to say thank you to the whole panel of speakers for joining us today and for taking the time to share your work with us. Um, next slide, please. Wanted to remind everyone that the PQA annual meeting is coming up online from May 11th through the 13th. Um, the meeting is going to feature three dozen speakers, educational sessions. We're gonna be talking about top issues and emerging trends in medication quality, medicate or measure development and implementation, uh, care transformation and technology. So a whole a variety of topics during the annual meeting. Registration is open now and early bird pricing does end on March 30th. So we encourage you to make your plans to join us uh, very soon. Uh, next slide, please. And then our next quality forum webinar will be on Thursday, the 22nd of April. It's going to feature a presentation related to community pharmacy and sustainable models for social determinants of health. So um, I make your plans to join us on April 22nd. And then I would like to remind all attendees that there will be a brief survey when you close out of the webinar today. So please uh, do fill that out for us. And the recording and the slides for this presentation will be available on the PQA website in about a, in about a week. We've got a couple of questions on that. So those will be available to you. Um, with that, I would like to thank you all for attending and uh, wish you a great day. <laughs>